Shabbat Shalom, everybody, and Chag Sameach Pesach. I hope you all had a very good Pesach, and um, you uh, are having a good time eating crackers all week, right, and uh, abstaining from chametz. Uh, I want to thank everybody that uh, came out for our second Seder at Temple Shalom of Ontario. And I would like to thank everybody that showed up for uh, the first two days of Passover services. So Passover services, there's actually, well, theoretically, we're in synagogue. That's right. Um, eight, uh, four days, actually all, all the days of the week. Uh, so each day there's another Torah reading. The important days though, are the first day, and the uh, first day, the second day, and of course the, la uh, the, the last day and the second to last day. So Passover one and Passover two. Now in Israel, there is, uh, they only have the first day of Passover, right? Because it said seven days. So out here in diaspora, in exile, as we call it, we have uh, two days of Passover. And that goes back to a time before 24-7, before technology, uh, before messaging was instantaneous. And it took them a while to get messages to people, letting them know that, you know, we had a new month declared a few weeks ago. We got a full moon, so Passover. And this way, the rabbis felt they were putting a fence around the Torah by making sure that people didn't miss Passover, okay? So... This way, people outside of Israel would be able to get the message and still enjoy it. These days, 2,000 years later, and some people will say, well, we've been doing it long enough. It is now a tradition. And the tradition is outside of Israel, the first two days of Passover are observed as very important holidays. The middle, what is it, uh, seven days, eight, seven days. So the middle uh, four or five days are what they call chokomoyek the intermediate days, which is kind of like a minor holiday. And each day there's a little Torah reading. Um, and if uh, then you have the Shabbat that's in the middle, that's Shabbat Chachomoed. If you have, if Passover happens to start on Shabbat, it's interesting because in the diaspora, we have two days of Passover that fall on Shabbat, the first day and the eighth day. Then, of course, we got the first day, the second day, the seventh and the eighth. The middle uh, four days, of course, are the Chochmoe, the intermediate days. So then there's a special reading. Uh, actually, it's always a special reading, but it's expanded to seven readings on the eighth day. Um, and they add uh, some extra uh, verbia, some extra parts of the Torah to make it that way. The other part of it is a little bit of getting a little technical here, kind of an FYI, uh, classes and sessions, folks. So on Shabbat, we have seven aliyah. And that, by the way, is the minimum. Uh, there's also another aliyah called the chosfat. You know, you have the Kohen is the first, the Levi is the second. Then you have five others. You call up anybody. Now, if you have a lot of people that you want to honor, and a lot of times we'll call up couples or we'll call up two people at a time. But if you want to start calling up extra people on Shabbat, you can do that. Uh, it's like an extra reading. You could basically give a layout on Shabbat to everybody in the, that comes to your congregation if you wanted to do that. However, on Passover and Shavuot and um, um, Sukkot, which are the three pilgrimage holidays, there's only five readings. Unless, of course, one of those days falls on Shabbat. Then uh, the readings are a little shorter because you have to drag, you have to make the five readings seven. Um, and you're only supposed to do five. That's it. You don't do more. And why don't you do more? Somebody happens to wander in the into the synagogue while you're doing Passover. You call up six leahs. They think, wow, it must be Shabbat. I know. <laughs> so that's kind of how the reckoning of the Aliyot goes. And just to kind of continue that, there's also five readings for Rosh Hashanah, those two days. Uh, there are six readings for, um, there are six readings for uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah. And there are also, and there are also three readings when you're doing a Saturday afternoon or a Monday morning or a Thursday morning Torah service. There's only three readings. Those are shorter readings. If it happens to be, to fall on either a new moon, 
Then they add a fourth reading for the a, re, a special reading for the new moon. And if it's Passover, they add a fourth reading for the Chochmoy. Okay. So that's the scheme of things. But again, I wanted to thank everybody for showing up to our second Seder. It uh, was wonderful. We had a good time. Uh, a little shortened, you know, so we get the food out. It, you know, it's really interesting how um, if you do a Seder traditionally, you're basically having, it's a long time. This time of the year, you would be starting after sundown. That means you're starting 7.30, 8 o'clock. By the time people are eating, it's like 9 or 9.30, especially. And if you're doing traditional, you're going to midnight now. Some people do that. I personally would have no problem with it. But, you know, I'm here for the congregation. So, of course, we abridge it a little bit, make it a little bit more fun, have the guitar out, and it's good stuff. All right. Without further ado, let's get into Acharemo. That's uh, this week's portion. This is after we've gone ahead and taken a break from the regular sequence of Parshas, uh, as we've been interrupted kind of, uh, or taking kind of a segue into uh, the Passover readings that are, of course, appropriate for Passover. Achremot, after the death, it picks up after the death of uh, Aaron's two older sons who went into the Mishkan, did some things they weren't supposed to do. And of course, you know, unfortunately, they paid for it with their lives. And that's just the way it is. So now what we have is we have three parts to this particular reading. First part is about Yom Kippur. And of course, Yom Kippur back then was different than the way it is today. Back then we did offerings. So they had the two goats. Uh, they drew which goat by lot was going to be uh, offered and one that was going to be sent out to the wilderness to Azazel. We'll talk about that. In a minute. And Aaron, of course, first the high priest, the first high priest and high priests thereafter would do their own offerings, you know, for their own sins. Some people think maybe there was even a second one for their family, and then the last one, uh, the second or third, depending on your point of view, was for the rest of the community. Um, the goat would be tied, that was, was being sent out to the wilderness, was tied with a red string. The other goat would be would be uh, used as an offering, a sin offering for everybody on behalf of everybody, along with a few other offerings. And the goat would be sent into the wilderness. When the red string turned white, everybody was forgiven. So the word Azazel, Judaism went through a period of time when it got involved in superstition. Now, some people may disagree with my using the word superstition or my point of view, but they started to see the word Azazel as a Babylonian de demon god, and you were appeasing the demon god by sending the goat out. Some people also feel that since Satan is God's prosecuting attorney, and during Yom Kippur, Satan is, you know, wanting to see, you know, what everybody's doing. Then basically you're distracting Satan so we can all pray and ask for forgiveness and, you know, get forgiveness and get inscribed in the book of life so we can continue on next year. But Azazel really means either the strength of God or it means out in the wilderness. There's a lot of, there's a, it's, it's kind of a weird, one of those weird ancient Hebrew words, but it doesn't mean, <laughs> folks, it doesn't mean a demon God. Right? Judaism does not believe in demons. Judaism does not, right? What do we say during the Torah service? We do not put our trust in any mortal nor on any angelic being do we rely. That includes demons. Not that we believe in demons. If you believe in an all-powerful God that loves us and helps us and sustains us, why would there be demons? Some people that are involved in Kabbalah or are very much into Kabbalah believe that that basically this is sent by Satan to tempt us, you know, see how strong we are. Uh, I don't know. I, I just chose to not even deal with it. Okay. A couple of minutes. I want to talk about chapter 18, which is the, the last part of Acharemo. This is the reading that's for the afternoon of Yom Kippur and it involves forbidden relationships. The chapter opens up with God telling Moses, look, when you guys, when y'all go in and and conquer and settle the land of Canaan. Do not engage in the sexual practices that the Canaanites engage in. Do not engage or the same sexual practices that the people in Egypt that you just left engaged in. Because we want to maintain this idea of purity. We were a light among nations. We have to show the world how to do it right. And, you know, you have to respect different people. 
<clears throat> so basically, most of the chapter involves uh, a prohibition against having sexual relations, intimate relations with intimate relationships, like father's father's wife, father's widow. You have a father, he dies, you got a widow. Can I get in, can I get involved with her? No, you can't. What about a sister, same father, different mother? No. And this is what a lot of the ancients would do. Um, in Greece, Rome, Babylonia, a lot of uh, uh, the royalty, even in England, right? The idea of blue bloods, they would marry off brother and sister, you know, to keep the gene pool as pure as they can. Judaism did not believe in that. You already have a relationship with these people. You know, you don't want to do that. You want to expand, right? You want to have purity. This also has the infamous verse, mankind, man shall not lay with mankind as one lays with womankind. It is an aberration. For that reason, there are progressive synagogues that on the afternoon of Yom Kippur choose to read chapter 19, which is the first chapter of the following Parsha Kedoshim. Um, for me personally, I don't see a problem with it because let's look at the context, okay? Was this back in the day, was it two adult consenting adult males that had a specific sexual preference? No, it was an aberration. A lot of it was a way to, you know, and I don't want to get real into it on a public viewing like this, you know, but it wasn't that type of relationship. A lot of it was child rape, okay? A lot of it was just whatever. So we don't do that. All right, but I want to make that clear. Some people believe that that means no homosexuality. If that's the way you believe it, fine. Don't impose it on anybody else. Uh, modern Judaism accepts non-heterosexual relationships because we believe in honoring the stranger and that's the reason for it. Okay, Shabbat Shalom. I uh, hope you had a great Passover. We'll see you in services. Congratulations to Bronte Tisdale and her bat mitzvah. Shabbat Shalom, Chag Sameach.